I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, increasing interest and discussion of President Donald Trump's reviving the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians in an attempt to nail down a two-state solution. There's even some optimism, even in the Jewish community, that Trump's style, his desire to cut a deal, is a new wild card in the Middle East deck that has gone nowhere up till now due to what most clearly has been Palestinian rejectionism and the refusal of the Palestinian leadership, both under Arafat and now Abbas, to even recognize the legitimacy of a Jewish state anywhere in Eretz Israel. But now, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has said he is prepared to resume negotiations with Prime Minister Netanyahu under the stewardship of President Trump. And this Jewish optimism has been embraced by one of world Jewry's most important leaders, Ron Lauder, who's just been elected to his fourth term as president of the World Jewish Congress. And one thing is absolutely clear. Few people in Jewish history have done as much for the Jewish people as has Ronald Lauder. He stands in the tradition of such iconic Jewish benefactors as Sir Moses Montefior and Baron Edmund de Rothschild. Ambassador Ronald Lauder has literally saved and revived much of Jewish life in Eastern Europe. And he is a fierce defender of the state of Israel and an unabashed critic of the BDS movement, which seeks to undermine the Jewish legitimacy of Israel in an attempt to destroy the state of Israel. But now Ronald Lauder is making news in the Jewish community by publicly endorsing Mahmoud Abbas as a moderate Palestinian with whom the state of Israel can and should sit with under Donald Trump to try to hammer out a peace agreement. Ambassador Lauder has also been very critical of the Netanyahu government for being unflexible. Well, while many are supporting Ron Lauder's call upon Israel, there are also many who feel he is deluding himself to think that Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority is moderate. And he's doing Israel no favor by criticizing Prime Minister Israel for inflexibility and for, in some way, criticizing Israel for its negotiating stance with the Palestinians. And one such Israeli analyst and commentator is Isli Liebler, who has known Ron Lauder personally for decades from Izzy's days as the leader of Australian Jewry before his making Aliyah. Izzy writes a weekly column for the Jerusalem Post. It also appears in Israel Hayom and is received through email by readers throughout the world and which you can access online at wordfromjerusalem.com. And Izzy is the leading centrist columnist on the Jewish scene today. There are many wonderful Jewish column, columnists on the left, on the right. Izzy is the most eloquent and most incisive from the middle. And Izzy Liebler joins us once again from Jerusalem. Izzy, thank you so much for making time to speak with us here on JBS. Shalom, Mark. It's good to speak to you. Okay, first, Izzy, you heard me characterize Ron Lauder's place in the Jewish community and his contribution to Jewish life and Jewish survival. Do you agree with my assessment? Not only do I agree with it, I would even go further. He has done magnificent things for the Jewish community. His heart is in the right position, and he's done so many things that he will be judged with very, very kindly in history for his contributions, particularly to Central and Eastern European Jewry. He has revived the World Jewish Congress, I encourage him to become the president after the upheaval with the Johnson era, and he has resurrected that body from zero to what is today a very powerful 
well-run organization. But it is, saddens me greatly to say that he's taken steps here which are not only damaging to himself, but damaging to Israel and the Jewish world. Okay, we'll get to that. I spoke to him. Hold, hold on one second. Hold, hold, on, hold on one second. We'll get to that in one minute. I also want to confirm, you have known Ron Lauder personally for quite some time, correct? I've been intimately associated with him, have kept contact with him, and really have a great affection for him. Okay. The man... Yep. The, the, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. The man what? As a man who, you know, came to his Jewish roots late in, the, in, in his life, yes. when he became ambassador, discovered anti-Semitism, and has devoted himself uh, as best he could to the Jewish field since that point. So, as a human being and as a person, I have great reverence and love for him. Okay, so I want but to make that... I want to, right. I want to establish that whatever your criticism of Ron is, this is not personal. I've had the pleasure of being in his company many times. He is clearly a committed, passionate Jew. So is he... Absolutely. What, what no is, question. We what, are in total agreement on that. Okay. Totally. So what is your main argument with Ron Lauder's optimism and encouragement of a renewed peace process under Donald Trump? Let me say this. We are going through what I consider to be one of the most important turning points in the history of Israel. We have an American administration which, for the first time, openly talks about having public identification and support and alliance with us. It is a time where I say we have to be treading very, very gingerly to make sure that we do not offend and do not make life difficult for Trump City stays on the right side of the angels. And for that reason, I'm totally in favor. If he wants to try and have another go at the peace process, we in Israel must give it every opportunity to take place. We must endeavor, if possible, to uh, negotiate because I have no doubt in my mind what the outcome will be. And unfortunately, I say sadly, sadly, all of us would like it to be otherwise, Cannot work, and I'll explain to you. I'll explain to you why in a, at a later stage. I hope. But the real point with Ronald Lauder is he is a world Jewish leader, and to me, there's an iron law that governs Jews in the diaspora. When you are in the diaspora, you don't put yourself in a position where you say, "I know better what is best for the security of Israel, for the people of Israel, and the elected government of Israel," particularly. When the elected government of Israel, with all its faults and all its dysfunctionality today, there is a consensus on Abbas. That Abbas is not a partner for peace, that we have to try and explore it to the very end. Now, if he said we have to cooperate with Obama in all of Obama's efforts to try to reach a peace agreement, there is no doubt that that is something I would totally endorse. But unfortunately, this is not the issue. He is saying something quite different. I understand. Saying, yeah. I understand. By the way, you just used the word Obama. Did you mean Trump? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip. It's uh, very right. bad. All right. Freudian slip. That's right. <laughs> you, you, are, you, you have no objection to trying to see how far Trump can get. Your criticism. On the contrary. On the contrary. I subscribe to every effort to reach out and show the world that we are the ones that want peace, that it's not our fault. But I say to you, if you have a little patience, there are four or five basic things that are required for peace with us. And I say to you that not one of these can be delivered by Abbas without being assassinated. Okay. It's coexisting, coexisting of Israel as a Jewish state, agreeing to security, to ensure the Palestinian entity is demilitarized, mm -hmm. accepting that the major settlement blocks will be incorporated, bringing an, ex an end to the foul exhortations of hatred from the mosques, the schools, and the Palestinian media depicting us as subhuman and calling for the destruction of Israel, relinquishing the Palestinian right of return to Israel, and terminating the weekly payments for murderers of Jews and 
pensions to families of martyred terrorists, not to mention ending the sanctification of mass murderers by naming schools and city squares after them. Now, I say that if he offered to concede on one of those things, the overwhelming probability is, A, he won't, but if he did, he'd be assassinated. And if he wasn't assassinated and we came to terms with him, we have a place called Gaza, which could take over the whole region. So I'm saying, Ronald, and I spoke to Ronald Lauder for half an hour on the phone, trying to persuade him that what he's doing is terrible because he has a relationship which goes back with uh, President Trump and President Trump is listening to him and the Prime Minister is concerned. He told me that he feels that Trump has been kind of influenced by him. I think this is a terrible thing he's doing. He doesn't realise it, but in a sense, and here, forgive me if I say it, it's very, very, very tough, but I'm saying that Ronald can do more damage if he persists in this than J Street, because inadvertently, not deliberately, but J Street is a dead duck as far as this administration is concerned, but he can have enormous influence and poison the atmosphere. And believe me, next week is such a critical week for us, and it's and we, all we need is someone to be saying that Bibi is the obstacle. I mean, the head of the World Jewish Congress, I'm sorry, much as I love him, much as I admire him, he's doing something quite awful here. And I pray that he comes to his senses and, and takes a step backwards. I've also said to the Prime Minister, why on earth don't you have a relationship with him? Because these two people have not talked to one another since they had a big upset between one another, which is a great tragedy. And partly... I think the Prime Minister should have gone out of his way not to shun him and spurn him as he has, because that may have made, I don't know if it would have, but it may have had a difference if they would have at least talked. But Ronald tells me he tried three times to talk to the Prime Minister and got nowhere. So I say there's a certain amount of responsibility on all sides, but Ronald is a world Jewish leader, and whatever he thinks and whatever he imagines cannot take upon himself the right to tell us what to do and to possibly undermine us in what we consider to be our basic essential security interests. And I say that out of a sense of love and respect, not hatred and not recriminations. I understand. I just pray that he wakes up in the next few days and takes two steps backwards. I understand. Because his heart is in the right place, and he has a, he has a messianic... I said, I said to him, you have a messianic fervor, the way he talks about Abbas wants peace. Believe me, this man... He's a monster. He mm -hmm. does not want peace. He is like Arafat, except he wears a time jacket. The things that he has said are unforgivable. The things he has done are unforgivable. But, look, if he wanted to make peace, I'd say we still make peace with him. Yeah. I can't see it happening. And we should not make him a tzaddik. This is a terrible thing. Because Trump, I think, looked and understood the situation in reasonably black and white terms. And now... Is being poisoned and, and confused, uh, confused. I don't know how much influence he has on him. I hope he doesn't have too much. But I pray that when Trump comes here, we get out of this because for Israel, this next week is a crucial, crucial week, and we should all be speaking with one voice. Okay. That goes, by the way, for the Israeli nuts on the right as well as on the left. I understand. And, of course, you're talking about the fact that President Trump is coming to Israel when you say in the next week correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to point out to our audience, it is not because Izzy Liebler is a columnist who writes in the Jerusalem Post that he is speaking both to, personally speaking to, Ron Lauder, and as you heard, he's had conversations personally with the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. It comes from his long, long years of service as a leader of world Jewry through uh, Australia, and he has a standing in the Jewish community that transcends his being a columnist. But is it you understand? It's very interesting for us to hear somebody say, "I spoke with Ron Lauder, and I spoke to him for a half hour, and I tried to convince him, and I couldn't." And then I talked to Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I said to him, "Why are you fighting with Ron Lauder? You should have made up with, uh, made up to him." And and Bibi is telling you that he's very upset and worried. Uh, it puts you in a very interesting position, and obviously it gives you, a, through you, we have access to the overall dynamic, 
which most American Jews simply don't get a chance to even feel, let alone to see and understand. I want to ask you a specific question here. Ron Lauder's comment is Mahmoud Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas is a moderate. When you spoke to Ron Lauder, was it your sense that he feels Abbas has moved? He once wasn't a moderate and now he is? Or did Ron Lauder argue with you that Mahmoud Abbas I pushed, him, I pushed him to give me an example. And he said, I can't tell you because I've had a lot of private conversations. And I know Abbas is extremely shrewd when it comes to manipulating people from the Western world and showing what a good guy he is and then saying the opposite to his own people or getting his spokesman to neutralize anything he said, which is good. So, look, uh, I couldn't get any sense out of him. Okay, and what about the fact... It's an obsession. What about your... He wants to make peace. I understand. All of us would like. I'd love to be the man who can say, I had a role in making peace to between Israel and the Arab world. But none of us should become too carried away with ourselves. This is not something that an individual can do. This goes very, very deep. And Arafat and uh, Abbas have poisoned the atmosphere to such an extent that the hatred, even amongst their people, is only a few decimals different from that of, 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 of in Gaza. And to talk about them as moderates, it's madness. Look at what he said, and look at the way they... Hold up criminals and mass murderers as heroes and saints. Look, uh, it's a culture of death, a culture of doom. Now, I hope one day we'll reach an accommodation with them. One thing, no Israeli wants to rule over Arabs. We would tomorrow break off with them if we could, but we have to look after our children and grandchildren and ensure our security. That still takes a priority. Okay, then I, I want to take a, a detour for one moment because what you said is critical to me. It's something that I've been saying on JBS for a long time. I've said it to you when you were in studio with us. I just had a conversation with Richard Haas, President of the Council on Foreign Relations. I tried to argue this with him. So I want you to address the next question for our audience very carefully. Izzy, if, Israel, if Israelis believed that Abbas and the Palestinian Authority was serious about living in peace with the State of Israel, recognizing the legitimacy of a Jewish state in Eretz Yisrael, giving up their right of significant return, and saying the conflict is over once and for all, and all we want, they say, is a piece of territory where we can create our own Palestinian state somewhere on the West Bank. If Israelis believed Abbas and the Palestinian authorities were being honest in that statement, they were willing to live without violence, not necessarily like Canada lives with the United States, but in quietness, maybe as Egypt lives with Israel today. What would the overwhelming majority of Israelis say? Should Israel make peace and give up the West Bank and create a second Palestinian state? Or are they saying now, that horse has left the barn, we don't care what Abbas says, we will not create a Palestinian state? Where is the vast majority of Israeli people, Izzy? It's all hypotheticals, Mark. If, 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 if Abbas did move in this direction, I can assure you of one thing, 80%, if not 90% of Israelis would move towards an accommodation and a peace settlement and be willing to make sacrifices over territory because territory is not the issue here. The real conflict we're facing is religious fanaticism and a desire to see us out of the whole region. It is not an argument over real estate. That's where Americans and Europeans misunderstand the situation. This is not an argument over real estate. This is an argument over our existence. Okay. The ultimate objective is to get rid of us. Okay. And if we can overcome that, we will have peace tomorrow. Absolutely. By the way, just so you know, I spoke with another Israeli journalist, Habib Retegur. He used the same number, 85%. If there were serious peace, and I don't understand why 
administration after administration here in this country, and as you now say, even countries in Western Europe don't understand it is not Israel's inflexibility which is creating the problem. It has been traditional, eternal re rejectionism by the Muslim jihadist world, which at the moment still controls the Palestinian Authority and represents at the moment the enemy that Israel has to fight. You, again, I've said now twice, you were a leader of Australian Jewry. You talk to heads of state all the time. Izzy, why do you think it is that American administrations have never got it and that so many Western European nations don't get it? Why? Well, I think part of it has been our fault because the Oslo Accords, in retrospect, was a mess. We picked the wrong partner. The idea of the Oslo Accords may have been good, the separation and ultimate establishment of two states. But the selection of people that we regarded as our peaceful allies were people who were predicated and dedicated to our extermination from day one. Deadly anti-Semitic terrorists. That's where the source of the problem comes. If you had Arab leaders, Allah Sisi, we will be moving in a different direction. But it's going to take quite a while, even with new leaders, to undo the poison that has been injected. Semitic poison which is injected, which is beyond belief. People don't understand the hatred against Jews, which is disseminated in those areas. Enormous. All right, Izzy, I want to speak to you with one, about one more issue. Um, <clears throat> Shmuel Rosner of the New York Times just wrote a piece in the Times slamming Israel. And slam, I shouldn't say Israel, slamming the Israeli far left newspaper, Haaretz, which is a, is a Bible for many liberal American Jews who believe it represents the thinking of a majority of Israelis, certainly Israelis who want a just Israeli society. In contrast, Shmuel Rosner contends in his Times piece that Haaretz has gone off the deep end when it comes to its virulent criticism of Israel, and that Haaretz now represents the thinking of very few Israelis. From your perspective, and I understand you're against the ideology of Haaretz, but I'm asking you to be as objective as you can be. How do you feel Israelis relate to Haaretz? Does Haaretz represent a significant portion of Israeli opinion and Israeli thought? I think the circulation speaks for itself, and it's been sinking and sinking, and uh, I believe it's, 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 it's under 5%, which is, you know, in the context of a left-wing newspaper, you'd expect a left-wing newspaper to have a much bigger circulation. But even many, many, many people in the left are disgusted and horrified by some of the stuff which appears there, which, uh, you know, would make people in Hamas purr with joy because they couldn't do better. That paper has lost its soul, and it does enormous damage because it is, it was regarded as an important national newspaper. It's still quoted as an important national newspaper, and our enemies quote it with great delight. And when you complain about anti-Semitism, they say, "Well, look, it was published in your own newspaper. Why accuse us of anti-Semitism?" As I've always said, the problem with Israel is we are our own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. We are our own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. We have created some of the biggest problems for ourselves. Do you understand how there are liberal American Jews who believe because it's in Haaretz, it must represent a significant portion of the Israeli people? I know, and that is uh, you know, something they would like to convince themselves of, but you'll find also that there's a very significant amount, number of American Jews no longer consider Israel important because Israel's way down the quota for them. Many of them are so assimilated, have so little Jewish background and understanding and education that you know, they cannot visualize what a nightmare for the Jewish world it would be if, God forbid, we didn't have an Israel today. Because of all the weaknesses and all the problems, Israel has never been as powerful and as strong a 
and as independent as we are today. And whatever happens, I'm looking forward with enormous confidence to the future because I know that we will overcome our problems. But I hope and pray that we can do this in conjunction with America, which is the only country I've always regarded as potentially our real and only true ally. Yes. All right, one last question for you. There are those who believe the current Israeli government under Prime Minister Netanyahu, it may not even be Netanyahu himself, but that he too is held hostage to a political reality, and that reality has created the Israeli government that exists today. And the criticism is that today's Israeli government is ideologically committed to a greater Israel, which includes the West Bank, and that it rejects the very concept of a two-state solution. So even though you and I agree, it's 80 to 90% of the Israeli people would embrace a two-state solution. Were it honest, there are those who still stand against you and me and say, yes, but the Israeli government is so right-wing, it couldn't be implemented, and it's the problem, which again is what Lauder suggested to you as well. Speak to that for one moment. Well, all I can say to you is there may be elements that want a greater Israel, but there are very few people except extreme fringe right wing that would like to see us absorbing another couple of million Arabs because we realize that were we to do this, our, our future as a Jewish entity and as a true Jewish state would slowly disappear and be broken down and we would become another Lebanon. So, no, I don't accept that. On the other hand, I do accept that the majority of people today say to talk about a two-state solution under the present circumstances is insane. Under the present circumstances. If those circumstances change, you'd be surprised how quickly it will change. And if the government is right-wing, there is still a democracy in this country, and they'll be thrown out if it happens. And it would break up. But I wish we were at that day, and I wish we could look to a situation where, you know, uh, we were arguing because there was a possibility of reaching such an accommodation. I don't see it. I, we all pray for it, but I don't see it on the horizon at this stage. Izzy, I can't thank you enough for always making time for us. You always are. I said it in the, in the open. You are a world jury's now leading centrist columnist. You know, everybody who disagrees with you says you're right wing. If anybody really reads the spectrum of Israeli opinion, they'll understand what right wing means in the Jewish world. You have a position which I believe represents where the Israeli people are, where most thinking American Jews are, and it is always wonderful to get your perspective. And it's a real kick to speak to somebody who has tried to argue with Ron Lauder and tried to help BB also see the light. Kol Tuva Hatzlacha, my friend. We will speak again very soon. Thank you. My pleasure to speak to you anytime. All the best to you, Mark. Thank you, my friend. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Izzy Liebler, whose weekly column appears in the Jerusalem Post and in Israel Hayom, and which you can receive by email every week by signing up at wordfromjerusalem.com. And if you're open to reading a perspective of a thoughtful, committed Jewish leader, it's not about left or right for Izzy. Again, he's an Orthodox Jew. He, like so many, would love all of Eretz Yisrael to be a Jewish state. But he lives in this real world. And he understands if there could be peace, if Izzy Liebler would join with the other 80 to 90 percent of the Israeli people, and that's what it would be. And as he said, they'd throw the government out if the government didn't agree. Anyway, if you want to read somebody wonderful, read Izzy Liebler at wordfromjerusalem.com. My thanks, as always, to our director, Sloan Copeland, production, uh, program coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, editors, Dennis Golan and John McDevitt, and the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.